delegates from overseas and home, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to introduce a prominent personality from India as well as a dear friend of Sri Lanka, Dr. Subramaniam Sami. The chairman of the BJP Committee for Strategic Affairs and former Union Cabinet Minister for Co Commerce, Law and Justice in India. Known for his candid expression of matters pertinent to national importance with enormous grip of history, Dr. Swami is an ardent supporter of a strong India-Sri Lanka relationship. I am certain that his insights on this aspect after the new government of India will be beneficial to all. Dr. Subramaniam Swami is a renowned economist, a recognized politician and a well-noted foreign policy expert who has played a major role in India's political affairs in recent years. He is presently pursuing many public interest litigations in the Supreme Court, High Courts and other courts in India to expose corruption of public officials. Dr. Swami gained prominence as an activist after he successfully lobbied India's federal agency, the Central Bureau of Investigation, to probe the losses from the allocation of state telecom licenses in 2008. The state auditor found in 2010 that irregularities in the awarding of 2G telecom licenses led to government losses of, uh, losses of 40 billion US dollars the Supreme Court then cancelled the licenses. Recently, Dr. Swami filed a petition in the Supreme Court calling for a review of India's jewel line law. His petition was against a jewel line, uh, jewel line accused in the gang rape and murder of a young woman on a moving bus in New Delhi last December, an incident which sparked nationwide outrage. Now, the new government of Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi has adopted his suggested amendments and has introduced a bill in Parliament. Dr. Swami was head of the Janata Party till 2013, which had formed the first non-Congress central government in India with Sri Moraji Desai as the Prime Minister in 1977, until Janata Party was merged with the Bharatiya Janata Party, which formed the government in India during 1998 to 2004 and now in 2014 with absolute majority. If I elaborate little more, he has been elected five times to the Parliament of India during the past. It was three times to the Lok Sabha, which is the lower house of Parliament, and twice to the Raj Sabha, which is the upper house of Parliament in India. He worked as the Cabinet Minister of Commerce and Industry as well as the Minister of Law and Justice in the early 1990s and served as a member of the country's planning commission, which was the government think tank. Born in Mailapur, Chennai, after his secondary education, Mr. Sami attended University of Delhi, from where he earned his bachelor degree with honors in mathematics. He studies for his master's degree in statistics at the Indian Statistical Institution. He has scholarly credentials having earned a doctorate in economics from Harvard University where he taught for many years. He was also professor of economics at the Indian Institution of Technology in New Delhi. Dr. Swami is a prolific, write, uh, pro prolific writer in his famed focus areas. He has authored several books such as Indian Economic Planning and Alternative, and Economics Growth of China and India, as well as a considerable number of imperative articles and research papers. He is considered as an expert on the Chinese economy and has visited China on numerous occasions as a guest of the Chinese government, various think tanks, and universities for sharing views and delivering lectures. He was also instrumental in getting a restraint order from the Supreme Court of India against the demolishing of the Rama Setu, which is well known as Adam's Bridge, the ancient bridge that connected India and Sri Lanka. Not only in the past, even today, Dr. Swami is known for his fearless and frank opinion on moral obligations, based on which he has been in the forefront in various public issues. 
He has a large following owing to his illustrious livelihood, thus frequently visible face in both printed and electronic media. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Subramaniam Sami. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, distinguished uh, government leaders, distinguished delegates to this uh, tremendous conference. I'm deeply grateful to the government of Sri Lanka and to the military in particular for this opportunity to address you in the concluding session. I also would like to begin by recalling that today, the 20th of August, is um, the birthday of Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, who is a very close friend of mine. We were allies, uh, both his party and my party were allies in the late 80s. I don't have a good opinion about his wife, but I do think very highly of him. And uh, he laid the foundation, formal foundation, of the Indo-Sri Lanka relations through the pact he signed with President Jayawardena. <clears throat> I would like first to refer to the oldest connection we have with Sri Lanka and how today it is a misunderstanding of the historical facts, which is partly responsible for some of the tensions that came between India, between Tamil Nadu state and Sri Lanka. Almost 10,000 years ago, according to our chronology, a king from Uttar Pradesh, Lord Rama, considered an incarnation of God, traveled to the south, and then his wife was abducted by the then king of Sri Lanka and uh, kept in a place which you can still see near Kandy, where his palace is still there, in ruins of course, where he where kept the wife of the king. And to rescue her, he had to come across to uh, Sri Lanka, for which he built a bridge with the help of coral stones. And uh, that bridge is still to be, can be seen, cutting half across, halfway across the Park Strait that divides India and Sri Lanka, or, or rather the Gulf of Mannar. And uh, that uh, bridge uh, would have been demolished uh, recently in the previous government tenure when they wanted to cut a canal through the uh, Gulf of Mannar so that in ships coming from, uh, from abroad do not have to circle uh, Sri Lanka to go to the northern parts of India. I had also, of course, gone to the court, but the government of Sri Lanka gave me a bonus. They declared that under the UN law of the sea, they will never give environment clearance to that uh, project. And therefore, that became a factor in my winning the case in the Supreme Court. So a special thanks to the government of Sri Lanka for doing that. But the history was distorted, as usual, by the British. They have distorted history wherever they have gone. And uh, that history said, made out that Ravan, the king of Lanka, was a Tamil. And uh, since he was portrayed as a demon, therefore they said he was from the lower backward classes. And uh, Rama was from Uttar Pradesh, northern Pradesh, northern, that is northern province. And he uh, was from the upper caste. And therefore Karnanidhi maintained that this was really the 
original war between the Tamils and the North Indians of India. Well, uh, Karunanidhi, as usual, got his facts wrong, which has never been a factor with him. And he didn't know that Ravan was also from Uttar Pradesh. Originally born on the borders of Delhi, he went to the holy spot where Lord Shiva, one of our gods, lives, which is in China today, in Tibet. It's called Kai, Mount Kailash. I'm not laying a, laying a claim to that part because our god used to live there. But the, the kind courtesy of the then chairman of China, Tsang Xiaoping, he accepted my request to allow our pilgrims to go every year. And that place is such a holy place that today pilgrims uh, stand up in long queues to get permission to go from the Indian government, at least to qualify because it's in such a high altitude. So after he prayed there and got a boon from God, then he searched uh, around which is the most prosperous part of this subcontinent and came to understand that there was a king called Guber in, in, in Sri Lanka. And therefore, he decided to conquer Sri Lanka. So he came all the way from North India and conquered it. Mr. Karunanidhi also didn't know that Ravan belonged to the priestly class of Brahmins, not the upper caste. And uh, Mr. The, the king of Ayodhya, Lord Rama, he belonged to a lower caste, the warrior caste. And he came and uh, therefore getting this history wrong, he began by portraying Sri Lanka as having uh, of people of descent from North India. And that is, became the Sinhalese population. And out of it being, uh, came a folklore. And the British then constructed a history that India is of two nations, one Dravidian, one Aryan, and the Aryans came from Europe, and the Dravidians were native. They were driven down to the south, so on. Now the DNA studies show that we are all, all Aryans and Dravidians have the same DNA. All Sinhalese and Tamils also have the same DNA. It's something which the Tamils of North Sri Lanka are finding it hard to digest, but I have challenged them to a debate any time, don't please call the struggle in Sri Lanka as an ethnic struggle. It's nothing got to do with ethnicity. It is if at all a linguistic struggle. So I begin by saying that much of our recent troubles has arisen because of the political polemics from the South. And this, since the party in in power in the state of Tamil Nadu, also became a part of the coalition. It led to a situation where we could not be of assistance to Sri Lanka in a fight which they were fighting, which was equal to the fight that India would have to fight, namely fighting the terrorists called the LTTE. The LTT killed Rajiv Gandhi, and uh, that is something which is held against it. There's no LTT. In, uh, in India, which is overground, whatever LTT is there, perhaps is underground. And uh, the Indian people have never supported the LTT. All elections prove that the LTT has no support. A handful of financial orphans in the Tamil Nadu have to make noise about it. So if you hear any demonstrations in Tamil Nadu, there are usually 35 people. They get arrested for the day, and then they are freed. Even my coming here, they had demonstrated, for which I am thankful, because nobody knew I was coming to Sri Lanka till they publicized it. <clears throat> now, uh, I think the, the problem, if I have to identify, that was created in Sri Lanka, which now seems to be more or less petering out, was created after independence in 1948 for Sri Lanka and 47 for India. At that stage, Sri Lanka felt that the British had brought in a lot of Tamils, and they declared them stateless and said they should be taken back. The Indian government obliged and said, yes, send them back. 
Then there was this problem that during the British rule, the Tamils were given preference. And uh, because of the fact that the British had already come to India and they had worked with Tamils, so there was familiarity. And it, through the process of of education, the Tamils acquired disproportionate share in the administration of this country and in, in schools and colleges. When uh, Sri Lanka got its freedom, 75% population being Sinhalese and an underprivileged lot because of the circumstances of British rule, they decided to rectify that and perhaps they over-rectified it led to uh, agreements between the Tamil leadership and the Sinhali leadership, which was broken. And ultimately, uh, some people convinced the Tamil population that the only way to struggle for your rights is by militant uh, uprising. Uh, it was a tragic mistake because it led to, it soon degenerated into into uh, terrorism and all militant movements do tend to generate into terrorism. So that ultimately led to the assassination of Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. We, Mr. Gandhi always regretted and he told me that my mother made a mistake, Mrs. Indira Gandhi made a mistake in training these militants. I think Ms. So Mrs. So Indira Gandhi was sometimes motivated by personal likes and dislikes in political affairs. And she had a deep dislike for Jayavardhana, who was president at that time, probably because he defeated her friend, Srima Bandranaike. So therefore, she was hell-bent on somehow bringing him down. And she even went to the extent of once declaring that Jayavardhana was elected with the help of the CIA. The CIA gets undue credit for work, which it never does. <laughs> but nevertheless, that is the extent to which he went, which is the most undiplomatic thing to say. But uh, the process, she encouraged the development of militants. And these militants then turned into a single militant organization because the leader of the LTT killed practically all Tamil leadership. In fact, if you look at the, the, the number of people killed by the LTT, they killed more Tamils than they killed Sinhali leadership. In fact, all democratic leadership that had grown in Sri Lanka was eliminated by the LTT. And of course, all rival organizations were also eliminated, and they emerged as a sole uh, organization. And it took... Uh, there was a lot of uh, hesitation on how to deal with it, largely because of international do-gooders who came to Sri Lanka and prevailed on them to negotiate with the LTT. You can never negotiate with a terrorist organization. The LTT, the Sri Lankan government, under international pressure, agreed. And having agreed, uh, they came to grief. But in 2005, I think, the present president came to power, and then he took this historic decision, fight to the finish, and eliminated the LTT. There was a heave of sigh of relief in India, and this is also demonstrated by all, by the fact that every election since 2009 in India, those who support the LTT directly or indirectly or in camouflage are recognized by the people and defeated. This time, too, all the proponents of strong action against Sri Lanka have been defeated in the Tamil Nadu election. I'm not talking about the rest of India. The rest of India, they don't exist. And, uh, and the government of Mr. Narendra Modi now has made it clear that we'll have normal relations with Sri Lanka and we'll try to develop it further. So as a first act amongst the South Asian leaders he invited, much against the vocal opposition of a minority, very small minority, he invited the president of Sri Lanka to be present in the oath-taking ceremony. There was a protest, but they were all arrested, even though they were, at that time, technically, allies of the BJP, of which I'm a member. 
So I'm saying that the new beginning is beginning, is taking, is taking place. We, we in India are now committed to improving our relations with Sri Lanka. We think that some of the things that exist today need to be clarified in the international context. So our government's approach is on certain core principles. Although today I am not uh, a member of the government, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how long they can keep me out of the government, but uh, uh, I can say that I have discussed it with my government colleagues and have come to the conclusion that these are the core principles on which we will deal with Sri Lanka. Number one, since we are an absolute majority in parliament, our foreign policy will be structured entirely on national interests and not on narrow, regional, or local considerations. We may listen to it, but ultimately it will be on national interests. And we think that we are best served, India is best served, by close relations with all our neighbors, and it should be consistent with our national interests. Some neighbors, we may have a little longer time, we may have to take a little longer time uh, to, to uh, stabilize our relations with them. But with Sri Lanka, we have no disputes. The dispute which is artificially created about the Tamil population getting its just rights is something that uh, we can, as friend, speak in private. But we cannot make it in, into an issue, a dispute, because it, we consider that as an interference in the internal affairs of Sri Lanka. And, an abridgment of its sovereignty. Yes, we do understand that devolution will, will solve the problem, but this is something that you have to do. Second, while in India subscribes to the UN Charter on Human Rights, we think the enforcement so far has been, in many places, and particularly in Sri Lanka, unbalanced, and unacceptably intrusive. Our foreign minister has made it clear to your Sri Lankan foreign minister recently that we will not accept any inquiry into human rights excesses, of course, unless it's genocide, and genocide, the UN, UN doesn't say it's a genocide. Only some crazy groups in, based in London say that. There's nobody who says this is a genocide. It cannot be a genocide because there was a very large number of Sinhalese who were also killed in the process. So it is not a targeting of one community by another. So we, we think that, that anything which is intrusive, we will not support. And therefore, we are very clear. Some of the NGOs who make so much noise, and particularly have infiltrated the United Nations organizations, they take this unbalanced view everywhere. If you ask the U U European Union, they will condemn the Israelis for their killing of children in, in Gaza. But what about those rockets which go from the kitchen of houses in Gaza and, and uh, kill Israelis? Or the beheading of the Israeli teenagers? I see no reference to it anywhere. Even in reports on on human rights excesses in, in Sri Lanka, the LTT, if at all, is mentioned peripherally. Original report of the United Nations placed it on par with what the uh, Sri Lankan army did. And I've never been able to understand the Tamil attitude in Sri Lanka, particularly those in the north, because the ones in the south, in the plantation, they have no problem, they are part of the government, they are ministers and so on. But in the north, they kept telling me that the army did all this genocide deliberately. They deliberately targeted the Sinhalese. And when the elections came, I found to my horror that the Tamils had adopted the commander-in-chief of the Sri Lankan army to oppose the president of the Sri Lanka. Now, how is it possible 
that the uh, commander in chief of the army knew nothing about the human rights excesses being committed by the army, but the president could alone, Mr. Rajapaksha alone, could be responsible for this uh, for this purpose. So this. For on this matter, I have got no explanation whatsoever from the Tamils. How did you adopt the Commander-in-Chief, Mr. Fonseca, as your candidate? And then say the Army is the one which did all the uh, human rights atrocities. So I find this in this unbalanced here. There's no explanation for the way the Israeli issue has been dealt with, nor is there any proper explanation as to why the Sri Lankan government is being targeted, except perhaps to sully the great achievement that the Sri Lankans achieved, that is to eliminate completely uh, a terrible, um, uh, a dangerous, well-developed terrorist organization, which by, by soft approach has enabled, had enabled it to capture vast parts of Sri Lanka. Today, the Tamil population honestly admit to me that we are relieved that when our husband goes to work in the morning, the women tell me, I know, we know that he'll come back in the night, not killed somewhere. When our children go to school, we know that they'll come back in the school bus in the evening. So there is an air of normalcy. There is also a fair amount of implementation of certain things with certain promises. For example, all the people who are in the camps, who are brought in as, uh, you know, dislocated personals, persons, all have been now rehabilitated, perhaps with a small number left. Houses have been built, infrastructure has been built, railway line is going to open perhaps in a couple of months. All the restoration has been done, and buildings have been, schools have started, universities are functioning, Hospitals are functioning. All these promises have been made. There's no question of targeting uh, Tamil areas. Perhaps the only thing left is giving police powers to the provincial assemblies. These provincial elections were also held by the same, the same government which is accused of human rights excesses against Tamils. No previous president thought it worthwhile to hold provincial elections in Sri Lanka. But they held it and lost the election. It is not that they were expecting to win. They, the president himself was advised that they were, he would lose the election, but he said this has to be done. And the elections were held, a chief minister was elected. When the president was invited to India, he invited the chief minister of, uh, of uh, the northern province of Jaffna also to accompany him. We were all looking forward to hearing from him. And then we got a surprise. The chief minister said, I will not travel with the president. I mean, he's not a president of a foreign country. If this is the attitude, then what will we think? We want to know why the chief minister declined to travel with the president to India. This means that even today, the psychology that is being built is that the Tamils should regard themselves as a separate community. We, we, we in India don't appreciate it. We don't appreciate any internationalization of any community. We also, uh, in fact, speak to our Muslim population to say, we support Israel, we have good relations with Israel, because Israel has been giving us not only good weapons, but they've also been giving us good intelligence on terrorism. We have no disputes with Israel, and therefore we are going to have normal relations with Israel. And the Muslim community should support it in the Indian national interest, not because Islam is under threat from the, from the Israelis. The same way we say to the Tamils here, that we, we have cultural links, but ultimately the policy has to be done according to the sovereignty of Sri Lanka. And therefore, I am surprised that there is any expectation from the people in Tamil Nadu, uh, Tamils in in Sri Lanka that Indian government will come to their defense. Indian government will not agree to any internationalization of any of our domestic communities. We think it's bad for us, and we think it's bad for nation states. So therefore, I would urge the Tamil community, I myself being Tamil, 
I am from Madurai, which is supposed to be the seat of Tamil culture. Most of the leaders, the pro-LTT leaders in Tamil Nadu are not from Tamil Nadu. Mr. Karunanidhi is from Andhra Pradesh, another province. Mr. Vaiko is also from Andhra Pradesh. At home they speak Telugu, they don't speak Tamil. And they give me lectures on being Tamil. Mr. MGR, who was the Chief Minister, was from Kerala. And I can tell you, if you really look at the history, the Northern Tamils did not come from Tamil Nadu, they came from Kerala. Because you can see from their food, their accent, it is all Malayali. They spoke, they speak Tamil because the Tamil kings came across here from Ramnath and occupied northern parts for some time. So therefore, this factor is in our mind that we neither will accept the Christians or the Muslims or the Tamils or anybody to have an international outlook, to place international interests above national interests. And therefore, Sri Lanka will also be in that framework. It is also in India's interna international interest to follow policy that does not create a power vacuum in this region. This is a very important region. The Chinese delegate appropriately talked about the importance of uh, the speaker before me, uh, Mr. Wei, they spoke eloquently about the importance of the Indian Ocean. Sri Lanka is strategically located. And to have uh, a situation where we become hostile to Sri Lanka or create an atmosphere where powers inimical to us decide to assist Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka is forced to accept their, ex their support, that is something against our national interests. So we we'll certainly would not like to see that Sri Lanka has no option. That is what happened in the previous government in India. When Sri Lanka offered India uh, the building of the Hamantota port, and Mr. Karunanidhi in, in, in Tamil Nadu said, no, no, you cannot participate in any construction, constructive work in Sri Lanka. And we had the government of the day, the Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, reluctantly had to give up constructing the uh, Hamantota port on credit. The, the Sri Lanka didn't want it done free. They were ready to, you know, take credit for it. I mean, take money or loans on credit. And when they left, the Chinese came in and they built a first class infrastructure there. And there's a lot of grumble in India, the Chinese have come, Sri Lankans have allowed the Chinese to come. They're not understanding that you created the vacuum which enabled the Chinese to come. So therefore, I would say that we are not going to follow a policy where a neighboring country, there is a vacuum created for countries who could, who could in, in, in the foreseeable, in the future, become adversaries. Because in defense policy, you don't go by intentions. Foreign policies, yes, we look at the intention of another country. But defense policy, we always look at the capacity of other countries. And so if a country which is, uh, which is different from ours is, is almost as large or larger than us, has a capacity which is more than us, we naturally will feel threatened. And we don't want to create a situation where that, uh, that leads to a vacuum. It is also in the India's national interest to create an e Asian economic pole. And that economic pole can easily come with ASEAN and S S South Asian uh, Association for Regional Cooperation, which is called SARC, which uh, contains about, uh, consists of about eight countries, maybe with Burma coming in, it will be nine. Afghanistan is also in it. And these uh, South Asian countries plus the ASEAN, and of course, uh, Sri Lanka is already a part of the SARC. We all come together in an economic union there are a tremendous number of complement, complementarities for India to exploit and India to, to be of benefit of being able to assist other countries. If you come to our country today, you will find people from all over Asia coming to our institutes of technology, our medical institutions and so on. And even from Africa people are coming because our education is pretty high class in, in selected centers. But at the same time, the fees are something that anybody can afford, not like in the Western countries. 
So there are many complementarities each of the Asian countries have with the others. And we have pool these, our, benef our, our uh, advantages with their disadvantages and their advantages with our disadvantages. And uh, together, we can create a very powerful economic union. And for that, Sri Lanka is a very key country for us because it's strategically located in the Indian Ocean. Over the years, we'll have to think about the growing piracy in the Malacca Strait, which, uh, for which much of the Asian import-export traffic travels through. And there, we certainly uh, think that a bonding of India, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia would produce a situation where India could assist in the policing of this this Malacca Straits. Uh, I, I think this is an area where we are all proximate, and therefore it is in a, we are in a position to do something about it. Malacca Strait is very, very important. It is on one side you have the Sumatra Island of Indonesia. On the other side you have these Indian islands of Andamans and Nicobar. And uh, these two are only about 70 kilometers apart. And uh, Sri Lanka being a, a uh, a base for operations. I think it will be a very powerful policing in instrument uh, for this, uh, this particular um, strait. So therefore, this also I think, we, we think it's Sri Lanka because it's very important for our national interests. I would say in conclusion that uh, we, we in India, are a political party which is not more of the same. There's no, you know, people talk about continuity. We are not going to have continuity. Recent incident with Pakistan is an, is an example of that. Earlier on, those who were for secession of Kashmir were allowed to meet the Pakistan ambassador, and particularly in the eve of talks with India and Pakistan. We were ha going to have talks with Pakistan, but uh, we found suddenly that all those who want to Kashmir to be seceded from India, who don't believe in the Indian constitution, they were invited by the Pakistan High Commission. And the government of India uh, canceled those talks that were to begin with Pakistan. Pakistan and these secessionists both said, this has been happening in the past. Why is it now, why are you now discontinuing it? Because there's a distinctively new party which has come to power. We are a party which has come to power, ironically, after years of being told that it's the minorities who will decide who will rule India. We have demonstrated today that without the minorities, we can come to absolute majority. But that doesn't mean that we will not try to co-opt the minority in dealings with governance, issues of governance. But it also instills confidence in us that if certain policies are followed, which may be to a liking, to liking of some groups, small groups, some not to the liking of small groups, it doesn't matter. We must follow what is ideologically our, our commitment. And our ideological commitment talks about a cultural unity in, in Asia. We are all the same culturally and different from the Westerners. China is included in this similarity of culture. In fact, if you, if you were to examine this cultural aspect in one example, and then I'll finish my, my talk. When I came as, went as a student to Harvard to get my PhD, my classmate asked me, could you please explain to me why the Indian people followed Mahatma Gandhi? So I said, why? what was wrong with Mahatma Gandhi that we should not follow him. He said he was not properly dressed. He was hopelessly underdressed. And then I began thinking that I asked him, in your country, leaders have to be well-dressed? He says, absolutely, he must have the best tie, the best, best coat, his shoes must be shining. Otherwise, he will not be. In fact, he gave me the example of Richard Nixon, who went to a debate with John Kennedy before shaving. And he had the evening 5, 5, 5 p.m. shadow on his cheek. And he lost the, election, uh, the debate on that ground that he hadn't shaved. Now, this is something unthinkable for us. All our spiritual leaders 
are hopelessly underdressed and in very inferior cloths. Even the president of Sri Lanka goes before a Buddhist bhikshu. You can see the same phenomenon. And uh, we have venerated them to great heights. In, a, in our system, those who have sacrificed, those who are spiritually minded, those who have uh, evolved, who are men of learning, they were placed above the king. And the king had to go to such people in their hut in a forest and seek their permission to declare war, for example. Europe was not like that. The king was monarch. He could decide everything. He was the Supreme Court. He was the government. He was the military. He was everything. But our system, we have a totally different approach where we try to harmonize material progress with spiritual advancement. I was very surprised when the previous prime minister, previous president of, of China, in the, national, in the Communist Party uh, uh, session, he said, China must learn to build a harmonious society. And he talked about values which had been inherited from the Confucian time and the Buddhist period. Now, that is what bonds us all together. And we think differently. And we value, we are, values are totally distinctive. And therefore, it is in our opinion that India, Sri Lanka, all the other SAR countries which accept this value system, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, we all should come together as a great cultural union also. And it is for this reason we place such high priority for improving our relations with Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. With the permission of the respected speaker, uh, I would like to open the floor for questions. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swami, for such a, an extremely interesting uh, speech. Uh, my name is David Daly, and I'm the European Union ambassador to <laughs> Sri Lanka. No hard feelings. And um, I just have a point of information rather than a question oh, yes, as sir. such, which is that the European Union uh, is in fact uh, extremely even-handed on the Israeli uh, and Palestinian question. And okay. last Friday, the um, foreign ministers of the 28 uh, member state uh, governments uh, agreed uh, again on this even-handedness, calling for um, the, a, a durable and abiding ceasefire, um, calling for uh, all terrorists uh, to be disarmed, uh, calling for the attacks against Israel uh, to be stopped and calling for uh, the lifting of the uh, Gaza closure regime so that the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip uh, could have a fundamental uh, improvement in their situation. And all of this is part of the wider context where the European Union supports, as you know, a two-state uh, solution where Israel can live in peace and security with its neighbors and uh, an independent Palestinian state uh, side by side. So I just wanted to bring that up as a point of information. Thank uh, you. But I did find your speech extremely uh, stimulating and interesting. Thank you very, very much. I stand corrected, and uh, thank you very much. And sorry for any um, pain I might have caused you. Yes, right there. Braden Narayan from the Indian Army, sir. Sir, we've been discussing uh, the regional and the global aspects of, and with Sri Lanka as the, you know, eye of the storm in the whole thing. Now, when we look at the Asian regions alone, post-independence or the time that came about, we see China has been able to consolidate, whether it was Xinjiang, Tibet, 
uh, exception of Taiwan, but Hong Kong and all this, it consolidated. Similarly, in the Southeast Asia, ASEAN consolidated, but the West Asia has remained fragmented, uh, maybe for whatever reasons, and CAR is in the nascent stage. Now, when we come to South Asia, what has happened post-independence is that there has been a lot of actually fragmentation of the regions. And we have tried to bring about SARC as an economic union. The problem lies in the security. Do you think we can find a way ahead in case this region, that is South Asia we've been discussing, focused on security, took lead from that, and then came to economy? Yeah. Well, it's a, a, a very well valid point. Uh, in fact, uh, SARC, uh, in fa uh, no item can be brought on the agenda unless it's unanimously agreed to. That, that also is something which weakens the uh, effectiveness of the organization. In Kathmandu, they're supposed to be in November, the next summit. And I think uh, this is a matter which uh, uh, I should be brought to the attention of the various uh, leaders. And I certainly from my side, I write a letter to the Prime Minister raising that this is now, as time has come to move forward on, on SARC and uh, even consider mutual security issues uh, of the SAR countries. Does that answer your question? Outcome, yeah. Yes, madam. Good morning, sir. I am the Secretary of Affairs of the Cuban Embassy. And I would like to first place a comment and then make you a question that you would like to elaborate. Yeah. Uh, since you know Fidel Castro, yeah. it is uh, one of the leading uh, is in long time in the history. And when he elaborated the matter of the Palestinian people, he said that it's not a matter of a religion. We say that the community has forgotten that the United Nations has approved the right to have two states in that part. And we, the Cubans, are against any a violation of the self-determination of the people. And we remember the international community that the Palestinians had never had the right to have an state. And we always have count with the Indian in the matter of the support, the self-determination of the people. And in the case of this area, in the matter of the religion, because we support the Hebrew and we condemn the Holocaust, but we are against the fascism. And the Hebrews are right now recognizing that Israel is committing fascism against the Hebrews and the Israeli and the Arabs also. So what, we would like then? that you elaborate yeah. in the matter of the self-determination is it wouldn't be more convenient to recognize the right of both states instead of only one state. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the... Uh, uh, the Palestinian state has still not been de, uh, de jure uh, formed. It's uh, still in the state of, uh, uh, in the process, so to speak. But uh, it was conditioned on the fact that the, uh, the Palestinians will also accept the existence of Israel as a finality. And I have not seen the Hamas uh, say any such thing. Even now on, uh, for uh, negotiating the ceasefire, there are a lot of uh, hesitation on the ground that they don't recognize Israel. And uh, there are countries which are supportive of these Palestinians who are also saying that Israel should be eliminated. Israel is formed by a, by a resolution of the United Nations. It's a member of the United Nations. And therefore, to call for its extermination or for its non-recognition non is absurd. So the day the Palestinians formally recognize Israel as a state, I think then the international community would move in to ensure that the Palestinian state also becomes a de jure reality. Yes, sir. I'm a Navy, uh, senior Navy captain from China. Uh, you just mentioned about the uh, economic corpor cooperation, and now the uh, economic cooperation uh, among the BRICS, you're very, very, uh, and uh, developing very fast. And so, for China, we have a very long friendship with uh, Sri Lanka. We already have made some contribution for the rebuilding the Sri Lanka economy. For every neighbor of uh, Sri Lanka, 
what do you think the India will uh, in the future will play? Uh, what kind of a role? What are the your suggestion for India to do a cooperation with uh, Sri Lanka? The first one. The second one is you mentioned about uh, Malacca Strait, very important. What's the uh, India's uh, future planning or future uh, strategy to cooperation with uh, Sri Lanka to maintaining the security of the Malacca Strait? Thank you. Well, as far as uh, China's uh, assistance, cooperation, relations with uh, Sri Lanka is very old. It's, um, uh, uh, it must be 40 years or more. And uh, we respect uh, Sri Lanka's right to choose its, uh, who it wants to be friendly with. Uh, we can certainly tell Sri Lanka uh, where we have some difficulty. We had some difficulty with one particular country which was uh, uh, encouraging terrorists to come to uh, Tamil Nadu. And Sri Lanka immediately responded by taking action. Uh, as far as China is concerned, we look forward to a very strong relationship with, the, uh, with China. The president of China is very soon coming to India. Uh, and our prime minister has, even when he was not prime minister, always spoke to me very highly about the need for having good relations with China. We are not uh, part of any strategic uh, tie-up which will be aimed at China. Uh, and in any case, if China were to get into a conflict with any country, uh, we are not going to take sides. So therefore, uh, the fundamentals are clear as far as India and China are concerned. And if you decide to cooperate with the uh, Sri Lanka on the economic affairs, we would be very happy to join with you. And as far as Malacca Strait is concerned, uh, the, uh, it is Sri Lanka which is strategically placed in order to really do. It, it's the powerhouse which will, uh, which will um, uh, move the navies of India and Indonesia. So therefore, I think uh, Sri Lanka is going to have a pivotal role in that uh, set setup. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm from Sri Lanka, a senior journalist, uh, Yogaraj. Uh, what my uh, yeah. question is, uh, yesterday we saw uh, Dr. Subhash Chandran was talking about uh, maritime uh, security and uh, uh, maritime economic cooperation between these two countries, Sri yeah. Lanka and India. Yes. But uh, this fisherman problem, yeah. uh, I don't know how to define this, whether it is a political problem or a security problem, but it is a problem. Yeah. But don't you think, uh, coming from the new government, uh, BJP, don't you think this uh, problem has to be sorted out or solved permanently uh, to strengthen the ties? And what is the solution you would put forward uh, to uh, the Sri Lankan government? Well, the, uh, the emotional issue behind which the uh, people who wanted to wreck our relations with Sri Lanka were hiding were that fishermen come from a poor community and they have been arrested and put in Sri Lankan jail. And uh, I came, uh, met the president uh, uh, in my earlier visit and I raised it with him and he was very spontaneous. He said, every Indian fisherman who's arrested will be presented in court and will be released on bail and sent home. But those motorized boats, mechanized boats that he comes in, they will not be returned. And that was a superb first step because these fishermen are not coming on their own. They are being pressured and compelled by the owners of those mechanized boats who are very rich people. Some of them are politicians. Some of them are DMK politicians. So therefore, uh, I have no love lost for that. And, the, and consequently, uh, to withhold those boats and send the fishermen back, the big Emotional issue has been uh, uh, taken away now. Now the question is the poor fishermen are not able to catch good fish. Due to reckless fishing in, 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 in the Indian side of the uh, medial line of uh, uh, Gulf of Manar, all our quality fish and, uh, and shrimps have been exhausted. They've been already fished out. Now the good fish, the export value fish, this shrimp, they are all on the Sri Lankan side. So therefore our fishermen are now being, uh, have been coming compelled by their uh, boat owners to go across to Sri Lanka and then uh, fish there. 
the, otherwise they'll not be able to export and they even uh, they will not be able to collect enough to cover the cost of, uh, of fuel for those boats. So we have to sit down with Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and say, give us three years to d uh, repopulate our uh, side of the ocean. And in, be in, be in between, uh, you give us some permit to fish in your side. And I was surprised to find that Tamils of Jaffna were opposing this proposal. So uh, when it comes down to bread and butter issues, you can see people get divided very fast. And uh, our fishermen for whom the, all these pro-LTT people were making so much noise in India are, are naturally dumbstruck because the, the fishermen of Jaffna, they are now putting up a protest saying, no, this is uh, you know, poaching in our area. But we have to find a solution by talking and I'm sure that uh, we will find it. This fisherman problem is, you can take it, is now more or less over. It's no, because there's not a single Indian fisherman in, in the jails of, uh, of Sri Lanka. And if they are uh, there, they are on the way out to go out and bail and return back to India. Well, one more question there, Doc. Yes, uh, sir. Sorry to interrupt you again. No, no. You know, uh, do you promote devolving powers to the region? Because in my, in my opinion as a Tamil uh, from, the, from Sri Lanka, I see that you know, devolving powers to the region it will promote regional patriotism, not the national patriotism. And it will be a detrimental or it will create a problem when it comes to the national patriotism. What is your comment? Uh, you'll have to say that question again because yeah. I think I misunderstood you. Yeah, what is it you say? Do you, uh, your, your BJP government, do you, in other words, in you know, the 13th Amendment or the devolving powers to the region, yes. do you, in Sri Lanka, do you promote uh, devolving powers uh, to the regions? Uh, in Sri Lanka. So we, my, my opinion is that... Yeah, yeah, I understand. You see, we are no one to promote it. But it's a widely accepted the constitutional principle that when you have different... There are no ethnic groups in Sri Lanka. They are linguistic groups. But one is a minority linguistic group, one is a majority linguistic group. So where do you have to accommodate, you, you have uh, provinces and they have devolved some powers. And from what I have seen of 13th Amendment, most of the important uh, amendments have already been incorporated. What is, what is now the bone of contention is these police powers. First of all, let me tell you, we have some states in India where we have not given police powers for special reasons. For example, the state of Delhi, uh, uh, with the capital re region is uh, being converted into a state. We don't give police powers to that state because it's uh, meaningless to have uh, a uh, central government and uh, a state government having two different uh, police. So we decided not to give. And uh, there's no, no protest on that. In the case of Sri Lanka, I think the police power issue should be solved last. Because I would like to see, uh, and I'm saying this as an Indian, and, uh, and I'm sure that 90% of the Tamils uh, agree with me, that these Tamils of Sri Lanka should demonstrate that they don't regard themselves as a separate community. Their behavior, I'm sorry to say, in the elections show that uh, they vote on the basis of purely that community interest. In our own country, I kept saying to my friends in the Muslim community, amongst the, uh, the intellectuals, that if you as a community vote against our party, it will be, what will happen is one day the Hindus will decide that they will unite and then you, you will become irrelevant. You will become irrelevant for everybody, including those who are today promoting you. And that's exactly what has happened. The, there was a Hindu consolidation this time in the elections and Hindus are 80% of the population and it was not all, I mean, only about 30% consolidated. And uh, that consolidation led us to absolute majority. And if that grows, then we'll get two-thirds majority next time. So in Sri Lanka too, the president of Sri Lanka is able to win without Tamil votes. In my opinion, that is bad for the Tamils, not bad for the Sinhalese. In my opinion, you should become a stakeholder in his election or anybody else's election. And the Tamils should vote on the basis of who can deliver goods to you. And there I would say that the Tamil leadership has totally failed. 
they have may kept them as kind of hostages these voters they have even threatened even today i hear stories about how uh, people are get threatened if they take a line differently i'm told the chief minister didn't was uh, originally inclined to come to india but then he was uh, 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 enormous pressure was brought on him not to go i hear this all the time i have large number of uh, friends amongst the tamils in from jaffna they meet me here uh, and they come to india they meet me they say this this is a factor and therefore my view is that the devolution will take place this is my prediction i am not saying that we are in a position to do anything about it will take place when the tamils start voting strategically and not on emotion dr swami thank you so much for your um, presentation there uh, you right here yeah right okay oh yeah you are from our favorite country afghanistan yes that's uh, <laughs> that's right um i like uh, i had mentioned yesterday that we need to start taking some and we have but uh, continue taking regional and creating regional responses to some of the economic but more so some of the security challenges both the known and the unknown challenges that we think we're going to uh, foresee in the future um we talked about um uh, what was mentioned yesterday about some of the spillover effects uh, that afghanistan could potentially have for the region but i also mentioned that there are various spill in effects some of these spill in effects um are are regional proxies regional conflicts between various countries like for example india and pakistan that have affected afghanistan and will continue to so from afghan side we're we're looking at yes what is happening afghanistan post 2014 in the region but also how will the region impact afghanistan post 2014 so in this regards afghans look at india as sort of the big brother of south asia and we've always had such strong ties <laughs> but now with the new government in place um yeah. what i wanted to know is what is india what concrete steps is india doing to address and mitigate these spill in effects thank you well, when you were giving the lecture yesterday i was tempted to ask you this question myself uh, now you asked me uh well you see we have very strong links with uh, afghanistan even historically in fact the mahabharat uh the all the trouble makers in our society came from afghanistan at that time and uh, uh shakuni who was uh, com- uh, governor of uh, kandahar was the one who was uh, was the evil man who plotted the whole uh, division in one family and caused a huge Uh, war uh, which led to a lot of bloodshed and so on so we have a uh, very soft corner for uh, afghanistan uh, we are not sure as to what afghans themselves want because so far the afghans have fought fiercely anybody who's come from outside whatever their intentions whether it was the british first then the italians or and then the russians and now the americans but uh, we have uh, afghan uh, your president was educated in india your foreign minister who was was slated to be president i don't know what's happened to that election he was also educated in india we have afghans uh, all over india uh, they we we don't recognize them very differently from ourselves if the afghan if we got the impression that uh, afghanistan is amenable to india's uh, concrete support on the ground we would be we are inclined but we know what we will be getting into we know that uh, pakistan is not in favor but of course pakistan has to soon decide who the civil society is because the presently the civil society doesn't seem to have power to uh, control the more militant sections and uh, the uh, the intelligence bureau of of that country uh, i may be wrong but this is the assessment given to me that the civil society is under siege and uh, i think uh, one of the uh, uh, leaders of the movement of march that march that has taken place has said uh, by friday the prime minister must quit uh, mr nawaz sharif so it's an unresolved question in pakistan if whether pakistan is going to become more militant it's going to become more taliban uh then a whole new situation arises secondly i think we we need to interact with china on this 
because after all, Xinjiang is also suffering uh, because of uh, militants uh, being trained in uh, in uh, in the in west of Xinjiang and using the route through Karakoram pass, uh, pass to come to Xinjiang. So therefore, I think China and, uh, and we have a common interest. And I think we need to enter into a dialogue with China on what to do once the Americans leave uh, uh, Afghanistan. And the planning should start now. But uh, we, are, uh, we are very well disposed to Afghan, Afghan people, Afghanistan. And uh, uh, if we could get some indication, a concrete indication from Afghanistan that they would like us to be more activist uh, despite opposition from anywhere else, uh, then we would certainly like to do this in, uh, uh, in, in joining with China on this issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, I am Brigadier Fayaz from Pakistan. Yes. And uh, being no politician, a plain military man, I would uh, yeah. talk very plain. You are no politician, you did you say? No, what did I, I didn't hear you. What did you say? Sir. Huh. I said I am Brigadier Fayaz from Pakistan Army. Oh, Army, okay. Yes, yes sir. And uh, I said being no politician, I would like to talk plain what I, what I know. First of all, uh, uh, the political issue uh, that you mentioned about, uh, which is ongoing in Pakistan currently, is purely a political issue. It is purely internal matter of Pakistan. That I agree. And uh, I would uh, suggest that uh, let's not uh, talk about it because uh, all of us do not know the realities of what is going on. It is a purely political issue. The second thing is uh, about uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan relations and what Pakistan's role is in Afghanistan. We are not against Indian involvement in economic uh, cooperation with Afghanistan. We are not against the political involvement even. But uh, we, are, we only have our security concerns and they are very, very much legitimate as India has. So uh, Pakistan is opposed to any interference from cross-border from Afghanistan, whatever is going on in Pakistan. And you also know that uh, we are in the final stages of the major uh, military operations that uh, Pakistan itself needed for its own security, that is needed for the regional security, that is needed for the global security. And uh, it has almost succeeded. We are very close to that. As far as uh, one more issue that you touched upon, uh, Kashmir, yes, sir, uh, I agree it is uh, the, the, the state, it is Indian government's decision and uh, to cancel the talks, but I would suggest that uh, uh, perhaps uh, this is the major issue between the, our two nations, which needs to be resolved. Yeah. And it will only be resolved through dialogue. And dialogue, whenever we get an opportunity, opportunity we must seize. Thank you, sir. Well, first of all, I, I assume that Afghanistan also has a say, no? If Afghanistan uh, decides that India should come in in a more comprehensive way, uh, would it be fair for uh, another country to say what Afghanistan should think? I mean, that's the issue uh, with us. We, we deal with Afghanistan bilaterally. Uh, we are no one to tell Sri Lanka, for example, don't have the Chinese here, don't have the Pakistanis there. We don't tell them. We can't. The, Ch the Sri Lankans won't even listen to us. But I'm saying that if Afghanistan feels vulnerable after the Americans leave uh, and wants uh, some guarantee and feels comfortable asking India, uh, I'm sure that uh, a uh, a civil society, flourishing civil society in, in Afghanistan would be in the interest of Pakistan also. I agree what are the developments in Pakistan are internal affairs. But if the prime minister is, uh, is uh, told to resign and there's a siege there, we who have uh, our people there as ambassadors and uh, high commissioners and so on, and we have been in the process of seeing whether we could ha have some talks. We had the Pakistan Prime Minister come for the 
uh, oath ceremony of the Prime Minister, uh, we have a right to be concerned because who are you going to deal with? If Mr. it's not going to be Nawaz Sharif, is there going to be a military rule? Is it going to be a, a religious uh, a cleric rule? Who's it going to be? That we need to know. I'm not saying you, we are going to decide who it should be. We are not asking you to decide according to our likes and dislikes. We are saying that we, it is of interest to us. Finally, you see on the Kashmir issue, we are not Congress party. We are a different party altogether. We have uh, certain commitments we have made to our party workers. We have made commitments to the electorate. And that is that, and we are committed to a parliamentary resolution, which was passed surprisingly by a Congress government, but headed by Nasima Rao, who's disowned by the Congress now. And that was that Kashmir is an integral part of India. And every part, including the part which we say Pakistan is illegally holding, has to be retrieved. That is the, our policy on Kashmir. If we can get that by dialogue, we'll be happy. But if we have to use other means, well, we have, we'll not rule it out. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Colonel Li Xiaolu from National Defense University of China. Uh, I'm very glad to hear you say that uh, China, India, and uh, other nations and Afghanistan can cooperate to realize regional security. Yes. Because uh, just now I'm a bit uh, concerned when you talked that uh, uh, it's not in India's interest to have a power vacuum uh, in uh, the region. And you gave the example of, the, of China got in uh, to, in the building of the Hamatata port. And uh, you, you suggested India and other nations may feel uh, threatened. I only want to assure you that uh, uh, our intention is not to compete for power and influence over the region with India. Uh, we want uh, the whole Asia to be peaceful, stable, and prosperous. Uh, we think that it's in our interests, and especially the South Asia. The prosperity and the stability of this region is very much relevant to our security. Um, so we feel that uh, as a country which is uh, relatively doing well, so we should help our neighbors. That's a win-win uh, situation, sure. a solution for all the parties involved. Thank you. Well, I know the Chinese position. I go every year to the World Peace Forum uh, meeting, which is uh, organized by your uh, Tsinghua University and the State Council. And um, uh, I have many, many Chinese uh, friends, both in government and the universities. I know your view. Um, you are for peace, you are for uh, harmony, and uh, all that. Uh, we, we are also for it. But I'm saying that we will not like to enter into Afghanistan without the uh, cooperation or the willingness of China. In other words, th we are, this is an area where we think that both of us have common interests. This is our view. And I may tell you, secret talks have taken place between India and China on the question of Afghanistan, and particularly post-American uh, withdrawal. And uh, this is not by this government. It was started in the previous government itself. So uh, we are concerned, and China is also concerned, because China has a problem uh, in, in Xinjiang from terrorists uh, who come from outside. And so we have common interests, and we need to develop that. And if Afghanistan wants it, and uh, if uh, China is agreeable and uh, India is uh, also ready to participate, I think uh, that is a thing that we can do. If Pakistan joins us in that, wonderful. I mean, it will be, then there will be no problem. Uh, but at the same time, I'll say that uh, it's really for Afghanistan to decide. And if Afghanistan decides uh, on, uh, on having this cooperation in, after the Americans leave, uh, we should uh, respond to the Ameri Afghanistan wishes. I don't see anybody else. Yeah, there's one more, yeah. Thank you for the wonderful analysis on the historical background and <laughs> the logical, how India is thinking logically about foreign policy and uh, especially with Sri Lanka. Now there's a new world going to come up. Just like a rising nation, it's a rising Asia also. So your country is going to play a very big role and you're going to have a much more bigger leadership role in the region and globally. 
So the digital world and the world with a, a clean environment and so on, could you give us a little bit about the future of leadership of India in the digital world and the cleaning yeah. world and environment and so on? Well, <coughs> I recall a very interesting comment uh, of the then uh, President uh, Sir Zhu Rungji of China, who said uh, China is a giant in, uh, in hardware and India is a giant in software and we, we two get, then we'll take over the world. Well, um, no, I mean, he didn't mean literally <laughs> physically taking over the world, but he meant in, in software. I think uh, this Asia is full of talent. In fact, even China, many of the things it does, it gets from Taiwan. For example, Lenovo, most of the thing is constructed in, uh, in Taiwan and is brought and then, uh, you know, value added and then sent out. So uh, the whole of Asia is in fact an enormous uh, reservoir of uh, cap capacity in, in, uh, uh, in software, in hardware. I also would like to say that world is always driven, uh, economic development is always driven not by more capital and more, more labor, but by innovations. Uh, if you see throughout, uh, the Industrial Revolution came because of locomotives and the Bessemer steel plant. Then the jet engines and, uh, uh, and this mass production technique which the Americans invented, that made a, brought about a change. Then the Japanese uh, changed that into decentralized production, which uh, uh, brought the Japanese enormous growth. And now the Americans in 1995 recovered through the internet, which has completely transformed the way you do business. In future, it will be perhaps uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cells for uh, automobiles, um, uh, use of shale oil, and uh, innovations are the key thing. And the here, Asians are in, in, in uh, sitting on vast reservoirs on, of, of talent and in young population. In our own population, uh, somebody mentioned about Malaysia, but our uh, India, 70% of our population is under 35. And uh, so we have a highly, a very young population. If they could be given good education, uh, top level education, they become innovators. We can, China is already doing it. Uh, Singapore being a small country but has now uh, become a great center for electronics. So I think Asia is, in my opinion, not only software but actually going to be the uh, technology, uh, technological cutting edge of the future.